Hi everyone. Thank you for attending this virtual event organized by Word Up Community Bookshop in Duende District. Uh, during this event, feel free to add comments in the chat panel, which can be accessed by clicking the chat button at the bottom of your screen. If you have questions, please click the Q&A button and put the questions there so that questions don't get lost in the chat. Uh, if you don't know what Word Up is, we're a community bookshop and art space run by local residents, many of whom who are volunteers. Uh, we can be found at 2113 Amsterdam Avenue at the corner of 165th Street in Washington Heights. We host events for all ages and sell used and new books in English and Spanish. So check us out at our website where you can buy books. Uh, because we're not open to the public for browsing at this time, we started a GoFundMe campaign to maintain our space and meet our obligations while closed. And we'll drop the link in the chat. Um, and I'll pass it over to Angela. Thank you so much, Carolina. Thank you to Word Up. Thank you to Veronica, who's a good friend who uh, runs the store over there. I am so excited. My name is Angela Maria Spring, and I am the owner of Duende District Bookstore, which is a bookstore uh, by and for people of color where all are welcome. We are a um, pop-up that has locations. Currently, we, we have boutique. It's a boutique pop-up bookstore. Uh, that works with other organizations and stores. And we have currently have physical locations in Albuquerque, New Mexico with Red Planet and in Washington, DC with uh, shopkeepers. So that's our on the ground locations and you can shop with us online at duendedistrict.com. We also specialize in carrying books both in English and Spanish, uh, but we only carry books by uh, black and brown authors and illustrators. So this is just, I am so excited. I know we've all had a very long week, uh, but we are here this evening for this amazing event uh, with Paolo Ramos, the author of Finding Latinx and Lupito Aquino. And I really could not be more psyched for this conversation about Paolo Ramos' groundbreaking and fascinating debut book, Finding Latinx in Search of the Voices Redefining Latino Identity, especially in the wake of, wake of last week's election, where it was truly ground home that our people are not a monolith, voting or otherwise, and how the term Latinx and the different identities it coalesces has continually evolved in the past few years. Hopefully we'll, um, so we are gonna have some time during the end of the program. I just wanna reiterate, um, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A field, not the chat field. We would appreciate that. Um, and then Perla is going to be in conversation with my dear friend Lupito Aquino of Lupito Reads. Um, and she is the co-founder and moderator for Lit on 8th Street Book Club, hosted at Solid State Books. Um, she is a passionate reader, active in both the local and online book community through her Instagram blog uh, at lupita.reads. And she is a columnist for the Washington Independent Review of Books, a contributor for the Reading Women podcast. And Lupita has been asking some of the really hard questions of both the Latinx communities and the overall bookstagram communities in regard to how we define and see ourselves via books. And I really feel like her work is truly vital in the Latinx literary community. So I'm so excited to welcome her tonight. Uh, and then of course, it is also my pleasure to welcome Paola Ramos, a host and correspondent for Vice and Vice News, as well as a contributor to Telemundo News and MSNBC. Ramos was the de deputy director of Hispanic media for Hillary Clinton's 2016 presidential campaign and a political appointee during the Barack Obama administration. And she also served in President Obama's 2012 re-election campaign. She's a former fellow at Emerson Collective. She received her MA in public policy from Harvard Kennedy School and her BA from Barnard College and Columbia University, and she lives in Brooklyn. Please, please welcome, just warmly welcome both of these amazing people, Paola Ramos and Lupito Aquino. Thank you. No, thank you so much, Angela, for the introductions. Thank you to Word Up and Duende for um, just having these spaces where we can come and have these conversations. And Paola, thank you so much for um, writing, you know, for, for doing this. And, you know, I'm just going to, I'm just going to start us off and, you know, really what propelled you to want to write the book? You know, what, it, was there ex an exact moment for you in which you said to yourself, okay, I need to write this book? Yeah, it was, um, it was funny enough. It was exactly four years ago, right? So it's, it's the 2016 presidential campaign. And my role in that campaign was a, um, 
fancy role. I would never ever uh, name it that way today, but it was deputy director of Hispanic press, right? For, for the Clinton campaign. And I think we woke up the morning of the election day exactly four years ago, convinced to our core that regardless of your political identities, no? regardless of what you thought, the Latinx community, Latinos would overwhelmingly reject Trump and overwhelmingly turn out to the polls, right? That, that was ba based, on what our, based on our assumptions and what we thought we knew, that's what we all believed. And so obviously, you know, it turns out the night of, um, that wasn't the case. Less than 50% of Latino eligible voters actually showed up. And so I think in that moment, I, I like had this big realization where I truly had no idea what I was even talking about, right? When, when we were talking about the Latino vote, when we were talking about Latino media, like who were we truly talking about? And so it was that moment where I realized that when we go to all of these states, we were leaving people behind. We weren't talking to people. We truly didn't understand the message. And I really didn't even understand the way that I was evolving compared to, you know, my parents' generation. And so I always think back to like 2016 election night and, and then we can talk about what, what happened now. And, but that, that was a starting moment. Yeah, no, and, and I, I, that's so interesting because I think in the beginning, you know, you really fold in your queer identity too and how that contributes to the term Latinx. And, and yeah, could you talk about a little bit about the term Latinx and how it helped you identify in a way with your queerness too? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think growing up, right? So my, my dad's a news anchor in, in Univision. And so I grew up around these images of what it meant to be Latina, right? And so in the TV screen, it was always, you know, Latinas looked a certain way, and they dress a certain way, you talk a certain way, you love a certain way. And that, 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 that's what I grew up with. And I even remember when I started doing stuff with Telemundo, I remember sitting, sitting in the makeup chair, no, right before I had to go on air and just sort of sitting there and then letting, letting them put on makeup. And I remember the first time I went on, on TV with Telemundo, I looked at myself and I didn't look like myself at all. I mean, I looked like a completely, diff completely different person. I remember my mom called me. She was like, what are you doing? Like, that's not, that's not you. Like, why, why is your makeup this way? And so that was me for a while. No, I was obviously openly queer. I, I had partners, but I never embraced it and never felt like I could truly embrace it in, in many of these spaces. And then suddenly the word Latinx comes, you know, I start seeing it. It starts popping up in, in different circles online. And I think that's, at least that, that was my relationship with this word. No, I didn't, I didn't know what it meant exactly, um, but it felt, it felt more like me. It felt like in this one word, I could fit all of my different stories and every single version of me and come out in the different ways that I could in this one word without having to explain to you or make myself feel uncomfortable in certain spaces, right? And so, which also means that it is an extremely controversial word for, for many other reasons, but that was, that was sort of my like personal connection to it. Yeah. And I mean, I think, you know, when, when I feel like identity in itself is just so personal. Right. And I think, you know, I, for me, the same different, the same, the same mm -hmm. exact experience I had with the term Latinx, really? you know? It, yeah. Same exact thing. Like I honestly don't even like to call myself Latina or even like Latina is a difficult word for me. I don't know why. why? I don't know why. I was like, <laughs> I don't know why it's, it's always been a difficult word, but when Latin X came out for me, it's just something that I was, I'm like, I feel like I can fit in that. And, you know, I think maybe it's what you said about Latinas and, and what we see in media. And I just felt like I didn't fit that description. And I always think about that, right? Because I think if if the word would have stopped at that, right? If if it, if it would have just been seen, and if, if it if it is just seen as a word where, they, you know, perhaps queer folks or people that are sort of breaking stereotypes, like if it is just seen as that, then I don't think there would be so much controversy. You know, I think people would say, okay, you know, they're using it. But I think the fact that then suddenly the story evolves, right? And then suddenly. And I don't know how it was for you, but suddenly people around me started using it too. You no know, folks that weren't even queer but that that just it started roll, it, like it rolled off their tongues no and and I think I think that's where now people are like alarmed no because suddenly mm -hmm. it's it's becoming more and it's growing more and, and and no one knows truly why yeah and I mean I think that even in your book you know um it was really important to me to kind of like really piece through and think about like the different people that you interviewed 
which are people that you their stories aren't normally told in media. And so I, you know, I was wondering how, what was the process of selecting the people that you interviewed? Um, were there any people that, you know, you wish you could have included in, in your book that you didn't? Yeah, definitely. I think the way, I mean, so much, especially, especially, I wrote it honestly, so and that's a whole other story. I, I did all of this in like eight months, right? Oh, because wow. I was, yeah, and and so I, you know, the, the, what you see, I think, is just one percent of tr like the, the true story that's out there. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I wish I would have written so much more, and, and I would have done things differently. But essentially, with the with the, with, with Penguin Random House, they were like, if you want to do this before the election, you got to go, like Oof. go now, no? Oof. And yeah, so so that that that's a whole other story. But the way that I saw it was, I think there's many ways, there's a thousand ways to do it. But I, coming from it, from the political angle, I wanted to sort of go back into these battleground states and go talk to the people that we never, that I never talked to um, what, when I was working in politics, right? And so um, I approached it through that, and I was sort of like through the, through the geography of the country. There's, a, there's a, obviously a thousand other ways to do it. Um, but yeah, so when, when I was in, in, in California, it was, it was looking at, you know, going beyond it, when I'm in the Central Valley, like looking at the children of, of, of the farm workers, right? And what, what were their struggles like? How were they trying to define the norms that their parents were going through? When I was in Arizona, you know, I spent a lot of time there through politics, but I had never spent time there like talking to the trans activists that are like truly changing the discourse there. And when I was in Texas, you know, we always talk about the wall in Texas and immigration in Texas, rightly so. Mm -hmm. um, but what about the other walls? No, what about, about all of these other issues? And so that sort of became in the formula, you no, know, to go to go into these states, the Floridas, and um, the, the 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 Midwest of the world, and and think about everyone, try and think about everyone that I wasn't thinking about. Honestly, a lot of it, um, I gathered a lot of stories through through Instagram, right? It was like asking people, I'm going to your state. What should I be looking for? No, who should I be talking to? And um, and so social media in that sense became like the best weapon I had where like folks would just connect me organically with people on the ground. Um, obviously through like some of the reporting that I had done, I had, you know, I, I had some ideas, but most of it, most of it was simply, uh, you know, chosen by states and then people connected me with, with, with people that, that thought they, you know, they, they deserve to sort of be included in this, you know, Latino narrative yeah. in a way that they, that they hadn't before. Yeah. Um, I did read an interview about how you mentioned the way in which you wrote each individual chapter. And I think, oh, it would, <laughs> I think that that's, that's something that one needs to be like, you know, praised because I mean, it's, did you tell me? I've never that? done this before. Yeah. I mean, again, this is, this is, this is all new to me, right? I, I really wanted to do this. And, and, and so as a first time writer, I, you know, I, I'm sure there, there's many, many different ways to write a book, but for me, again, give, given the limited time that I had, um, the way that I did it was essentially there's like, you know, 11, 12 cha chapters in the book. And so for each chapter, I essentially, I'm basically, I, 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 I'm talking to you from Miami. I typically live in Brooklyn, but basically I was in Brooklyn. And so I like outlined everything. And then for each chapter, I would go to that state in bed with them for like a week, you know, transcribe everything through my phone, go back to New York city, write the first draft of it. Like, you know, do all the transcribes, like go through all the interviews, like outline the chapter write write a draft and then go back on the field and so i did you know it per per state and so i did that you know probably at least 10 times 10 11 times i was like go back to new york write the chapter go back out and and it will i'm sure there's i'm sure there are many other ways to, to write this book but i at the end of the day it was the only way to do it and, and i i think i learned a lot it, it gave me it sounds chaotic but i think the stillness of like being in front of a of of a computer, which is something that I, I haven't I, truly looking back, like I haven't really had moments of like silence to like just like listen and write. And so the the process was very, it it was very beautiful. No, it was it was like a time and a stillness that I've never truly had in my life. And I and I do think that in a way you kind of spend more time right with each individual story. Yeah, and and that that was important for me. I think perhaps the way that my, my brain works and just in everything, like I have to, I, I definitely wanted to devote, like I, I'm not one of those people that can do, a, I mean, I can, but I can't do like a thousand things at once. So it was very important for me to make sure that I was spending, I was allotting enough time per chapter instead of like writing many different chapters at the same time. 
Um, that that's something that I, I knew I wanted to do. No focus, at least like a week of field reporting or two weeks and then and then going back. Um, and I and I was curious, something that really stuck out to me about your book is that you included photographs and that you also like, you know, you didn't change the identities of any of the folks that you interviewed. And I, I was wondering while you were writing, if you ever went back and forth about that. Of course. Of course. Yeah. I mean, I, I think for for any any and all reporting that I've done, you first of all, you always ask for permission. You, right. you have to. Um, and then but then there's always the then you, there's always the balance of knowing when it's ex, when you're exploiting something, no? Mm. And mm. you know that's always something that I keep in mind as a storyteller. Up to what point are you taking advantage of someone else's story, right? Mm. And that's just something that I'm always balancing, right? You can't go in and out of these places, right? You can't sort of tell these stories and leave. And mm. um, you need to, and, and I, I, and I'd say that's that's probably the hardest part of this all, at least for me, is something that I, you know, you you need to build trust, and 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 the trust has to be genuine. And so, so yeah, so that means that like when someone says yes, um, is that in their best interest? Mm. There's there's you know there's a lot of pictures that I didn't include. Um, I think the ones that I did include, I think there's also the flip side of, particularly in the younger in the younger generation, there is a a pride, no, in putting your name and your face yeah. to something, perhaps in a way that like the older folks didn't. Mm -hmm. And and that I think was like a through line of it all. No, yes, I want my my name to be included. And yes, I want my face to be included. And yes, I want to speak out, which hasn't always been, I think, the case in, in storytelling. Um, but I think with, with the ones that are there, it's, it's very much a, a statement, I think. Yeah, um, and in, it definitely comes across that like that. I think for many of the individuals that you interviewed, um, and you know, something that that like you know, thinking back to interviews that I've seen uh, you on, and that I've you know seen you interviewed in, you know, something you said, and this is going to apply to. I know we kind of all want to get into it, so I'm, we're going to get into it. The Let election, me guess <laughs> the 2020 election. But um, you, you said something like, I think it goes back to the heart of the problem, which is they don't feel like they belong in the US. Mm -hmm. And this was a mm -hmm. statement in relation to what could potentially be driving Latino mm -hmm. Trump support within our community. So I was just wondering if you could speak on that and in what ways you possibly envision like a term like Latinx might help mm -hmm. like that loss of belonging and maybe unity in our community. Yeah, I mean, I've I've obviously been been thinking a lot about it since since yeah. the results. Ob I mean, for context, right? I mean, I think, I think we, we all know <laughs> we, 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 we we all have. And, and, and to be completely honest, I I I do not have crystal answers for absolutely anything, which I think is okay. I think it's I think we always like rush to like diagnose and analyze mm -hmm. and tell these stories very quickly. Mm -hmm. I, I I do think it's important for all of us to like take a step back and like read, read the numbers, like what are people saying? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it, it's something that I saw in the book. It's something when I was doing research for the book, it's something that I've seen time and time and time again through through every, you know, trip and, 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 and reporting that I've done, which is, which everyone knows, you know, the, the story of assimilation is so much of the core of what it means to be a Latino in this country, right? Our, our parents, someone in our generations, when they come to this country, you are told and you are trained to believe that in order to achieve success in that American dream, you must assimilate. And that can look many different ways, right? That can mean like you're told to not speak Spanish. That can mean that you are told to bow your head down. You're, that means that you're told to live with imposter syndrome your whole life. But at some point, assimilation is very much the core of what, you know, the pain that a lot of families have to the point that I think it obviously it perpetuates internal racism among us, right? You um, want to belong so much with them that you want to forget about the others. Um, so you, want, you want so much to be in the boys club that you, you can and you allow yourself to forget that one day you too were an immigrant, know that you too come from an immigrant family. And I, I mean, I see this constantly, constantly. And I think that's one of many factors, right? I think there's a factor of like, there's the misogyny, you know, that, that is there. And there's a factor of misinformation. And there's a generational factor, but I do think the core of it all is, is that story of belonging, right? And who offers you belonging? 
and and then and so I think does does Latinx does does that term solve anything? No, but it does at least force us to at least it, it's it's helped me understand where where that drive comes from. You no, know? I've been in many situations in rooms with people um, that are Latino Trump supporters. My gut is to close the door, reject, and mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We, we, you know which I do, but. The, the term Latinx at least makes me be less shocked when I hear something like Donald Trump on 35% of the Latino vote. That doesn't shock me, right? That is part of understanding that our community is extremely, extremely diverse and that it doesn't mean that they're conservative Latino Trump supporters. It means that at some point they've been lost by the system. No, at some point, both parties lost track of these people. No one, no one made them feel like they belonged. And so I think there's a deeper conversation there about how do we offer that sense of belonging? Yeah. Again, it's a million dollar question. If you if you figure out the answer, let no. me know. But no, you know, and and I think that something that I think that your book does, and that I think books like yours do, is they open up abilities to have conversations and discussions. And and you're right. I don't think any of us really have the answers. I think a lot of what being Latinx or being Latino, especially just thinking about the election, mm-hmm. like it's evolving, right? Um, Were you shocked? To, to, to see these results? Um, you know, I think I wasn't, I wasn't shocked. Um, I think I was, I think I was just processing, you know, and then I realized how much of that processing uh, was really kind of pushed by the media instead of focusing yeah. on, yeah. you know, how much Latinx turnout we did have. It was like, completely. Oh, look at how many Latinx folks actually voted for Trump. And that's the story. Yeah, of course. You're absolutely right. I mean, the, the story people want to run with is that like that shocker story, which again, is not as we knew it, it's not shocking, but you're absolutely right. The, the story is is way more positive than and the, the, the story is a beautiful one. No, we did show up and we did, you know, obviously Black people paved the road and we walked along their side and we we, we stirred the country in a different in a different direction and we did that so um but yeah i think there's an obsession right now yeah to dig, and, to dig into which which is which is okay but i mean and i think it's just that there's a lack of duality right like two things don't seem like exactly they can at the same time exactly like we can't exactly. have had people that voted for trump as well as had like a massive turnout i mean so exactly i mean right. what what about the media that you've seen so far has been just so aggravating or off for you uh, I'm curious um I mean I think I think the, the first people. one yeah I mean the perfect example just this morning you know you you turn on um the the New York Times the uh, the daily and you have you know white pollsters that are trying to interpret um what happened and you can you can you again you can you can look at the numbers but it's it's one thing when you when you're you know this like a, a white poster that's looking at the numbers and then telling the stories and interpreting the stories for us no that's that that i think is is problematic there's a thousand incredible latino posters latinx posters in the country that like have a better sense of and like the pulse of what's happening they, that number one right i still think there's there's a deficit in terms of like who is telling these stories um I do think the the idea that there is such interest now is great, but it's it's it is if, if we would have had, been having this conversation exactly when the campaign started two years ago, mm-hmm. it'd be a very different story, right? Mm-hmm. I think I think we'd we'd have a better understanding. It's it's a representation of just the lack of resources and understanding that have been put into into us into like breaking that down. Um, and then again, yes, there there is a tendency right now to blame, you know, the the the, the storyline that everyone wants to hear is, you know, the Latinx community was was responsible for giving Trump, you know, that push, or the Latinx community was responsible for Joe Biden losing in Florida. When the reality is, no, compared to 2016, more white folks voted for voted for Donald Trump, mm-hmm. and simply Joe Biden didn't. Did, you know, did, didn't do as well with the white vote as was originally um, envisioned, right? There was this whole narrative of like white women voting for Joe Biden, you know, white suburban women voting for Joe Biden, that, you know, people w- would see these images at the border and that would make them think twice and it didn't. Yeah. And so that's that's the story. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I'm, I 
So a topic I'm personally like paying close attention to um, as the election results are evolving and um, is, is just the discussion around what diversity looks like, um, mm -hmm. specifically in terms of like the terms Latinx or Latina, Latino, and how they don't really capture skin tone. And the fact that, you know, Latinx folks that phenotypically appear white have vastly higher privileges than Black and Indigenous folks of course. in the community. So I know you don't have all the answers. I don't have any answers, but you know, what, what are your thoughts on that? And most importantly, like, how do we tackle this that I think absolutely, you know, we say it, we talk to your families, uh, show up, you know, how do we show up, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you're absolutely right. I don't think, I don't think Latinx, I don't think that the term Latinx is is the answer. I don't think it, it, it fixes any of the erasure you just mentioned. I do think, at least the way that I see it is, it is a conversation starter to at least get people to start opening their eyes, right? Mm -hmm. I think right now the terms like Hispanic and Latino, Latina, when, when, when you and I say those words, an image comes up, no? a, a very mm -hmm. clear image comes up and it's an image that carries a legacy, a story, and it's full of limitations. And so the only thing that I'm sort of advocating for is, 100%. The, the 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 term Latinx erases people by and in of itself, and just just what the letters mean. Mm -hmm. But at least at least no, it's a conversation that forces us to say, look, among the 60 million, there's at least three million Afro Latinas amongst us. There's at least one million Indigenous folks. There's at least you know Latinos that are also Muslim, not just Catholic. Mm -hmm. um, it, it looks at, it inserts an image and it starts breaking a stereotype. Now the conversation should evolve, and it must it it, it, it must evolve. But at least it's like bringing in the bringing in the voices that are left out, and so. Um, and I mean, I you're so just, right, though. You're so right. When you say the word Latina, it's like it's like a test. What does that? What brings? What does that bring to you, to mind for everybody? You know, like. In something, and including myself, and that was you know part of in, in the in in one of the chapters um, when I was in Florida, um, in with organizers, like Afro-Latinx organizers, that was an exercise that we all did, right? Where the organizers asked us, everyone in the room, close your eyes. When you think of an immigrant, what does it look like? Mm. You know, for me, it was brown folks. And now when my, my mind took me to Mexico, when you think of a Latina, what does it look like? Literally, I thought about like, Eva Longoria. I mean, literally. Right. Like, <laughs> no, for sure. And, and so, and then it was like, open your eyes, right? And then you looked around us in the room and it was full of like, you know, black Puerto Ricans and black Colombians. And that is not, that is not what any of us were thinking about. And so at least when, when, when I say the word Latinx, people will say, que es eso? like, what are you talking about? But at least it's like, it's, it, it is, it is the, to make someone feel uncomfortable is, is good, no, to, 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 at least if, 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 the end product is simply to get people to open their eyes a little bit more than, than it's good. It doesn't solve for it. And, and in terms of like how, like our families, like how do we, I think, I think there's a certainly like a, a big generational difference where like, yeah, for sure. I think particularly like I saw it a lot this summer, right. With like the young, young Latinx, like folks that were like out in the streets, you know, with the poster saying, hey, you know, tu luchas mi lucha, your fight is my fight, mm -hmm. no, like giving voice to like the Afro Latinas finally, and to an Afro Latinx voice to and folks to, I, I think I've seen a change this, particularly this summer with, with the younger folks. And again, I'm talking to you from Miami where like these conversations are so, are so hard in the moment. There's, there's mm -hmm. so much rejection to even understand, right, that like there's such a thing as like black Cubans among us mm. and that I you know I think there, there's still a lot of work to be done for sure no yeah I completely agree um and I so I'm conscious of time I want everyone else to be able to ask questions so I'm only going to ask one more question uh so now's the time throw your questions in the Q&A box and I will read them to Paula um okay so the book is out in the world we know the results of the election um specifically the latino vote i feel like that should have been a drinking game like every time <laughs> that was seen in media someone should have like took a shot or something but yeah. anyway, <laughs> how, sure. how do you feel about the term latinx still like do you feel like it's still possible you know um is there a yeah. solution for you to encompass us and all of us under this term yeah, I mean, I think I think if if there is a lesson learned from the election, finally, it's like it, it is that we're not a monolith, no, and at all. And so in 
in in the story that is being told right now of, of how we voted, I think it very much tells the story of the Latinx vote. No, we didn't all vote the same. We voted in many different ways and people took us in many different directions. And at the end of the day, that is that is the idea of Latinx. No, we saw in a place like Arizona, it was like young Latinos that rejected the past of their parents under like SB 1070 and, and voted a certain way and drove change in a certain way, even though it was expected them to you know, to not do that. Now, that to me is a, is a Latinx story. And you saw that in Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. And, you know, then you go to a place like Florida and, and the Rio Grande Valley and you see that, you know, some Latinos voted another way. It, that is also a Latinx story, right? It, it's understanding what is driving us to, dive, to, to go in these different directions. And because that doesn't mean that we're in different directions. That just means, again, that at some point, um, we've lost track of what unites all of us. And, and so I do think at least it's, it, is, it is an important conversation in terms of understanding why we're so different. I'm really curious to know who is that 50% of Latinos that didn't show up, right? Who did we leave again? Who was left out one more time in this cycle, no? And are those still the same voices that we left out in 2016? And, and do you replace that 30% of Latin, Latino voters that are always voting for Republicans? Do, do you stop paying attention to that and start veering your attention to the other voices? No? And I'm very curious, like everyone that I talked to in the book, did they feel seen this time? You know, did politicians knock on their doors? I, I'm not sure, I don't know. And if it's no, then I do think there is, you know, there is an even a greater argument to be told about Latinx means this, no? Just focus, focus, focus on those voices. So, they, so yeah, I think it's, I think, I think it's very complicated. But I, I do, I yeah. do think at least it like crystallized this idea that like we truly are way more different than we think, and that we have more questions than answers. More than anything, that we that people don't know us as like much they as they think, think they do. do. Yeah. Yeah. Not yeah. even ourselves, honestly. So. No, I think you know like just some some of the really small nuances things that I picked up in your book um that I didn't know before you know it's and I'm constantly learning like and and we're all you know and and I you know I it it's I'm bound to mess up you know and and I'm bound to to not check myself and I want to I want people to tell me that, no? And I think I think that like openness and, and conversation is, is hopefully what we can have these conversations in a way that I, at least I know like my my parents never did, no? And I think that's a big difference between like, I think yeah. the, the two generations, yeah. And, and I think a lot about the, I think they instead of being called, called, called out, you're being called in, right? You're being called mm -hmm. into action. If exactly. there is something that happens, right? like you know and, and you know I I have some people that follow me on Instagram so like there is this, we know like, anxiety behind saying like saying the wrong thing and although it's my opinion and it's always very limited and I try to say it's very limited it's 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 scary to be kind of like right of course so, like, yeah you you are like the of course the person that knows about Latinx right <laughs> yeah and it's it's just it is it is always to, to be the only person, and I'm not talking about us, but I'm just talking like in, in these institutions and like even in media, um, for the sole responsibility to lie on one person, like that's that's part of the problem, right? Um, at least I'll tell you just from the political world, like there is, there truly has not been enough resources invested in, in understanding these questions of like identity. Those are the most basic questions that like people know about different things in the world. like. We, we don't know because many people haven't invested the resources in, in, in allowing us to, to have many of these answers. And anyways, that's just one, one part of the, of the problem. Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna move into Q&A because we're getting questions and I don't wanna leave anyone out. Um, so Sarah said, thank you for acknowledging the anti-Blackness in our community. Uh, will you be using your platform on Vice to explore and continue the necessary conversation on finding Latinx for the future um yeah i mean i with with vice i you know a lot of people are always like why do you only do latinx stories and like why are you so fixated on the latinx you know narrative but no to me like it, it it's important to use those platforms to 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 shed light on what's happening in fact i'm, I'm gonna go back to arizona 
um, next week. Um, I want to go to Georgia and understand like, you know, what Latinx folks are doing there, like how they're being pulled into this coalition, no, what, what it means to be seen as, as part of this like changing coalition. And, um, and yeah, and I think more than anything, there's, there's particularly when it comes to like anti-blackness, I think there is a lot more to dig into. Um, and it's not a story for me to tell, no, it, it's at all. It's a story for me to like, to uh, allow others to, to tell. And, I, and at least that's how I, I try and use the Vice platform, no? Um, I'm there to sort of offer the platform, ask questions, but those, the stories are typically always guided. They're always guided by someone else. And so I, I, do, I do hope, especially as we're moving into another administration and like people, I think, want to talk about what is happening I, I really want to be thoughtful about, about how to use that platform. Um, so Lauren asks, do you think moving away from the term Latinx is a better move as we continue to see that we are not a monolith? It feels like we came up with a new word to replace the old one that wasn't always work that wasn't working always and continues to have the same issues. I mean, I think it's I think that's a fair question. I think um, I want to see if a world in which we are inclusive is one that works. Maybe it doesn't, right? Is 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 can this word be inclusive? I I don't I don't know the answer to. My gut tells me yes. My gut tells me that we haven't fought for it enough. My gut tells me right now that people want to revert back to like other terms. Like I don't I don't see this as a continuation of, of Hispanic or Latino Latina. I see this truly as like an experiment of okay, can can, can we be inclusive, right? Can I be in the same room as a, a black Latina and a trans Latina and a light skinned person like myself and get us all to understand that as different as we are and as, as, as our privileges are completely different, is there something that we have in common and can we have a collective voice? Perhaps the answer is no, but I do, I am interested in investing my time and understanding into like, is there such a thing as that collective story right now? Particularly with those voices that haven't been, that haven't been included. And I don't, I don't know the answer, but I, I, my gut tells me yes. Um, yeah. Um, and this is actually a question that I get asked a lot too, because I, I use the word Latinx is, does the word Latinx work outside the US? Um, because for Lat Latino Americanos uh, recently yeah. moving to the States, the term doesn't ring a bell. Completely. I mean, again, I, I think the word is extremely US centric. I think the word Latinx tells, tells a very, spe very specific story about what it means to be a US Latino in this country. I agree 100%. The second you go, part of, part of Latinx also is understanding where the erasure, where these erasures start from. No? So I, I do think there is, there is some opportunity to be able to connect these stories um, across the border. But I do think as it, as it stands right now, it is very much the story of what it means to be us in this country, you know? in, in this culture, in these demographic changes, in this political system, and with our family story. And so, um, yeah, I, that's, that's something that I get constantly. And it'd be interesting to explore, like, does the, work, does the word work elsewhere? Probably as it currently stands, no. I mean, I, 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 you know, I've, I've heard, but also, if we, if we take a step back, you know, like the idea that like, just because you're, you know, a Colombian and a Cuban and a Venezuela, Guatemala and like all these countries, and then we come here and like, what, now we're all of a sudden like all supposed to call each other. <laughs> yeah. And I, I understand like conceptually, like it, it, it is, yeah. it is, it is, it doesn't, I get it, right? I, I get why people are questioning, like, is there such a thing as a Latino vote? But I, I do think there's such a thing as like what it means to be us in this country under these times. And yeah. yeah. Now, and I mean, I, I, I completely agree. I think it's even with, uh, I was thinking about pronouns the other day in Spanish, you know? Sí. And so I think a lot of that, I mean, because we're so US based and for me, like I've lived here all my life. And so mm -hmm. I just don't, I don't know what that's like in Mexico for pronouns and, you know, um, so. Yeah, no, it's the same. And yeah, I mean, yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe that's part two of the book. Yeah. Does it work? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is actually a really good question. I really like this one. Um, do you think that the pushback 
the, do you think that pushback that the term Latinx receives from non-queer members of the Latinx community der derives from the pushback against queer identities per se, which is rationalized as the linguistic anchorage of in inherently uh, gendered nouns, Latina, Latino? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think I always question those exactly, those that, um, that are pushing back like wh where does that sort of like anger come from, mm -hmm. right? I am, um, that to me is very interesting. Like where, what is this like, this like vehement rejection to this word and to change really? Cause that, like, how do you impact that? No, it's more, it's more than to me, at least it's more than just exactly. It's more than just about like the A or the O. It's, it's more than just people saying, no, you're anglicizing a word. Again, these are all like valid concerns, but it does stem from a like, Perhaps it's it's misogyny, it's being homophobic, but you know there's many nuances there, um, and so that that's that's why it's 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 important to like always ask those follow up questions, because the moment that you put a face to the X, people start being less scared of it, right? And that that's happened to me with my own family, right? My own grandfather, my own my own my own dad, like my my family now says it, but I had to explain like, look, these like this is what it means no you know this person like you you know it, it is someone like me it, it, it is also someone like you and then and then people start like you demystify the word a little bit um, but you know I also just think naturally when you insert an x and, and words people anything that's uncertain no or, or weird looking is, is always like there's always this this gut this inclination to reject that and you just have to push through that um, yeah, I think sometimes a lot there's a lot of misinformation of when the term originated or where who made it up, and you know, I think sometimes that also gets pulled into the conversation. And things are extremely right now, especially it's a completely politicized word. No people, I mean, the amount of people that have told me that it's for communists or it's a word yeah. for socialists or yep. for lefties, for it's like you know the, 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 every everything is political now and it's so hard to cut through so hard to cut through that and and that's just something we're gonna have to get used to you know because i was like that that disinformation doesn't that doesn't end regardless mm -hmm. of who's in power mm -hmm. right and so yeah you know no. you just have to keep keep having those conversations with people mm -hmm. um so lauren asks um how do you how do we talk about race and colorism with the Latinx umbrella and acknowledge white supremacy in the midst of it? That's a <laughs> um, I mean, you know, I, little little things that I've little exercises that I've done um, like when I'm in when I have to talk in, in Telemundo, right? One of the Spanish language um, networks. I always, I, I always try and make sure that when, when we are talking about, um, you know, whether it was like about Black Lives Matter or about what happened in this summer, make sure that you include an Afro Latinx voice in that conversation. And that surprisingly, that that's a new thing for many of these networks, right? And so what, what I, what I try and do is obviously I, I acknowledge the privilege that I and 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 just how biased my voice can be, and so I am. I again, I am. I am. I am no one to be to be driving our community through these stories, and so I make sure that there is an Afro Latinx voice in these platforms. Um, same thing when I did my first my first book interview, the first 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 one on NPR. I made sure that I wasn't just you know the only voice in that, right? And I made sure that Dandeli, one you know one of one of uh, the the people that I interviewed, you know, she's Afro Dominican. She's a lot of the heart of this book. I made sure that she was there telling her story in her own words, right? And in her experience. And so um, that's sort of my, that, that's, that's what I'm trying to do, what I've been trying to do, making sure that like in, in the privilege and in, the, in, in, in these like platforms that I have, which, which again is an extreme privilege, making sure that I'm pulling in, pulling in the voices. Um, you know, and then slowly, slowly like that, like breaking these biases and breaking these stereotypes. But but I think it's it's until we normalize it. No, it doesn't. It, you just have to continue to normalize it, right? It, it can't be the case. Like my dad is a, again a news anchor in in Univision. His co-anchor is Afro Latina, and 
it can't be the case that there's only one Afro Latina news anchor in all of in, in all of U.S. mainstream media, mm -hmm. one, right? And so she is normalizing it for other people, and she's pulling in other people. And so again, that that's just the 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 little efforts that I'm that I'm trying to do. Um, so I'm also I'm conscious of the time. I think we have maybe uh, time for maybe two more questions. So I'm sorry if I am going to miss some of your questions, but um, know that yes, we appreciate your questions and we appreciate you asking them. Um, so Paola, will you ever have an open Zoom meeting to hear divergent Latinx stories? I would love to do that. That's a great idea. Yeah, I would love, I would absolutely love to do that. I, again, I, I use, I use social media a lot to just make sure that I'm, that I'm paying attention to things and like, and that's folks tell me what I'm not doing right and, and, and what, you know, what I should be looking at. But I think I, that's an actually a really great idea to just do like a big Zoom conversation and like a big brainstorm and like discussions. And yeah, I love that. Yeah, it's a good idea. Um, that'd be really awesome. Yeah, I would love to like listen in on that. <laughs> no, me too. No, that okay. That's well, well, we can we'll organize something. Well, and I just feel like it's so like good to have that right to have spaces where you hear about your individual experiences within your community because we mm -hmm. are so vastly different. Yeah. So completely. Okay, um, this is from Lisa. I wonder if Paola could speak to those of us with no or long ago immigrant experience. Is that addressed in the book? Um, and then she goes on to say, to me, the term Latinx has the same problem other terms do, um, which is that it feels like an umbrella term that embraces a lot of identities within that. Again, similar to queer in my view, which can encompass people with very different ways. I use the terms Latinx and queer for myself. But as an indigenous Southwestern Latina, I have no meaningful connection to the immigrant experience. I feel affinity with immigrant Latinx people, but not because of the shared history or experience. Yeah, I mean, the, the I, I think that's, that's a story that different generations of, of Latinx folks will say that there, there is, you know, that, that closeness to the immigrant story perhaps isn't there in the way that it was anymore. I only use that as like an entry point in conversations, right? And in the way that um, I just remind, I just as a reminder to myself and to, to, to people that if, if there is one thread in common, as far removed as you are from that narrative, I, I like to think of it as, as what, what makes our community as different as we are and as divided as we are empathetic, right? Which I think is a very unique thing of us. The, the, the empathy, we, we, we are people with empathy, you know, we are people with solidarity. And a lot of it has to do because we embrace our rights. We're meant, we're supposed to embrace our rights in ways that perhaps others didn't because that, that was for, for many people that would, would jump the journey to this country, you know, regardless of how far removed you are from it. And, and so to me, I use that as a way, as like an entry point of like, we all, we all have that in common and so, if you believe that, you no. Know, if if you believe in 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 that original story, then then you can believe that you know whether you are indigenous or trans or um you know Afro Latina, or you live in the Midwest or in the border, there is that empathy in common, and we can start having these conversations eye to eye. That is why I like to use the term Latinx because unless 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 you see it that way, then you know, me being in Florida will have nothing to do with you being in the Midwest, will have nothing to do with folks being in California. Perhaps that's okay. But as I said before, I, I think particularly with the younger folks, I think there is, it's an exercise that's worth doing. At least it's, it's worth trying out. And, and I, I like to believe that there is a coll collective story and vision and message and that we don't know yet. We haven't like articulated it, but I do think there is one that it's worth going for before we truly like devolve dissolve into this like identity crisis which i do think we're also going through yeah i would that's exactly what we're going through <laughs> i would call it exactly that an identity yeah. yeah yeah um so mitzi um has a really great question too um she says as she continues to listen to the conversation 
she can't stop um, to think about, she can't but stop and think about the undocumented and DACA dreamers and, and how they had a big effect on the election. Although they couldn't vote, they were unafraid and came out to tell their stories to end a stigma. Um, will you be open to explore a conversation with current DACA dreamers undocumented about how this election has shaped or changed their life? I, that's a great, I would say, yeah. <laughs> that's something you should do. Of course. No, I mean, I've absolutely. Um, absolutely. That was, you know, before the election, that was one of the last stories that I did with, 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 um, with dreamers in Arizona that were organizing, um, all those like eligible Latinx voters that could vote. Um, again, you know, dreamers that saw their parents be criminalized under SB 1070 with like jar pie in their mind, the best, the best, the best, the best, you know, lessons learned stories to be told organizers, um, are dreamers. And, um, and again, they're the ones that are changing the course in Arizona, in Nevada, every, just everywhere in the country in terms of like what it means to to like to to use your voice. And so, I, absolutely. I mean, I I am always a always a better person after I after I am exposed to that. So, talk about a story that would be great in the media, right? <laughs> yeah, they're, they're they're sort of touching on that in Arizona and Nevada, but it's always very like surface yeah. level. But I, of course, I mean. You know, and that's that is that is now the next what the next sort of political story is, right? When there is a this Biden White House, like the accountability begins on day one. And as you right. know, as with Barack Obama, like dreamers will be leading that, right? And they will be holding holding this government accountable. And and we need to get behind that and we need to like under you know tell that story. Yeah. All right, uh, so our last question. Um, what did you think about the majority of Venezuela's, Venezuelans voting for Trump? Um, I'm half Mexican and Venezuelan. I view in divergent articles that many Venezuelans view Biden as a socialist. However, I'm not surprised due to the long line of colorism and political division that uh, European Venezuelans have towards indigenous and Afro Venezuelans. Mm -hmm. Look, it's a very, it's a very similar to the Cuban story, very similar. Um, I think there is, there's many things. I think there's, again, there's the, there's the misinformation factor, which was just absolutely, it's, to this day, it's like absolutely rampant. And sp Trump spent the last four years drilling and drilling and drilling and drilling that message. It worked. And, but that, but you're right. It goes, it's, that, that would be too easy to dismiss it as just misinformation. Then I do think, and I say it all the time here, no? Cubans voted for Trump despite the fact, and Venezuelans, despite the fact that, you know, the Trump administration had essentially closed the border to Cuban asylum seekers, despite the fact that Cubans were being deported by this administration back to Cuba, and despite the fact that most Cuban Americans and Venezuelans benefit from the ACA at rates that are higher than any other place in this country right here in South Florida. And so the, that hypocrisy stems from, again, this idea of like, it's, it's, it, it is racism. No, it, it just, it, it's, it's racist. And so, again, it, understanding our community means understanding like, yes, we're not just conservative, but we are also racist. No, we also do perpetuate racism. And, and I, yeah, it's, it's a very, very similar story to the Cuban one, if not the same. And those, those are very interesting stories too that, that mm -hmm. are making a lot of headlines. <laughs> Um, yeah. So I, I just wanted to say thank you so much. Um, thank you to everyone for your amazing questions. Um, thank you to Duende. Thank you to Word Up, Paola. Thank you. No, thank you, honestly. And, and thank you for, for everyone for listening. And Duende, Word Up, you're, you're always providing these like incredible spaces and like really thoughtful conversations. So um, I'm very grateful. And it'll be that you're amazing. It's amazing to to finally get to talk to you and 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 thank you for doing this truly. Yeah, uh, and make sure everybody grab a copy from Duende or Word Up. Um, it's a great read. <laughs> thank you for coming. This was an amazing talk. I know everyone on social media and in the chat are having the best time right now. Um, but yeah, uh, please buy a copy. Buy a copy from Bookshop.org and support both Word Up and. Uh, Duende District and also all the other local bookstores. Um, and yeah, if you want to follow us, please follow us on Instagram, Facebook, whatever. Um, and thank you both for having this conversation. This is amazing. Thank you. Thank you. All right, bye everyone. Have a good bye. night.